In this video, I will be giving you my initial thoughts on the Mac Studio Ultra, why benchmarks are useless and unreliable, and many outright lie, and talk a little about the mini controversy that Apple brought on themselves by comparing the Ultra to the 3090, and finally I will tell you which machine I think you should buy. So I received my studio last night and the unboxing was uneventful as you might have expected. So there's no reason to bore you with the whole process. So I just B-rolled it right here. Basically you have the studio, a power cord and the usual sticker. Uh, it feels heavier than it looks. And when I first picked it up, I was surprised that it was like back heavy. Uh, almost wants to tilt in my hands. I would have expected the weight to be more balanced but it's a desktop machine, so not an issue really. Just an observation. Uh, at the back, turn it around. At the back, you can see all the ports and all their glory. The four Thunderbolt 4 ports, the 10 gigabit ethernet, the two USB-A slots, and the HDMI port. And of course, the audio out jack. Uh, now, some people complain that the HDMI uh, port is not 2.1. But considering that the number of Thunderbolt ports you have, you can use one of the others with an HDMI dongle if you need a higher refresh rate. Uh, and since I chose the Ultra, the other two ports are Thunderbolt 4 ports and the SD card slot, which is glorious for me because I use the mirrorless cameras that use SD cards and I'm always in need of getting out my footage. Now, I chose the base Ultra with the four terabytes of SSD uh, to give me enough headroom to do uh, any work locally on the machine that I need. While I would have loved to do eight terabytes, I didn't feel I needed to spend that much since at some point in the future, uh, a NAS capable of using the 10 gigabit ethernet uh, will be part of my workflow. And that should be more than enough to allow me to work with video files. The machine itself is super quiet. I can't even hear the fans. If I put my hands in the back, I can feel the air coming out, but other than that, it's really quiet. From very light use so far, it seems fast and snappy, uh, but any real conclusion would have to come after using this for a few weeks. I've been using the M1 Max MacBook that's behind me for several months, and it's been amazing. I can only imagine that this thing will be a screamer. I'll be doing an in-depth review of this in the near future after using it for a while, so consider subscribing and hitting the notification bell to get notified when that video comes out. So overall, I like the design and the smallness of it. Uh, it is hard to fathom that this much power exists in such a small package. I just wish they had a better way of cleaning it though. I can see a lot of dust collecting in here and it would have been nice if they had an easy way of removing this grill uh, to vacuum it out. Other than that, at this point, I don't have any real complaints for the design. Okay, now let's get to the topic of benchmarks. Uh, before I tell you why benchmarks are not a very good metric, let's first talk about where Apple messed up. Their first mistake was comparing the Ultra to the NVIDIA 3090. During their presentation, they showed a graph comparing the Ultra to the 3090, but they cut it off at about the 300 watt point, just when the 3090 would probably blow the Ultra away. I get what they were going for. They were trying to point out how much less power the Ultra consumes while being able to go toe to toe with the 3090. They should have known that they were going to get skewered for this. All Apple had to do here was focus on performance per watt and then just blow the pants off Nvidia when the Mac Pro comes out. Uh, my guess is that machine will probably be nuts. I'm sure that if Apple increased the power the Ultra consumed, it could be just as fast, if not faster than the 3090. That is the real benefit of this machine in that it can do real work while the fans barely kick in. They would have been better off showing a clip of a, of a loud PC tower with the fans going full blast next to the Ultra just chilling. So the second mistake Apple made was not letting software vendors know the Ultra was coming so they can start preparing the applications to support the new chip. The whole, we have Ultra Fusion so you don't need to update your apps is a bunch of bull. I've been writing software for almost 30 years and there is no such thing as not having to update your code to support new hardware. Even their own apps are not ready for this chip. Being able to render video faster is one of the big selling points and their own Final Cut Pro is not even ready yet. 
I exported a video with both my M1 Max MacBook and the Ultra, and they both exported at the same time. Some of the reviewers with review units had the beta of Final Cut Pro, which is not available to the public yet, and the Ultra was much faster than the M1 Max. This whole secrecy thing with Apple hurt them here. They're getting hurt by reviewers who are not mentioning that optimized apps are not available yet and just saying the Ultra is no better than the Max MacBook. These are part of the reasons why I don't really like benchmarks, especially the way they're used. They have become an indicator of overall performance and experience, and that is not the case. Uh, many companies in the past have lied and cheated in order to get higher benchmark scores, and still do by the way. Intel was big in the cheating game. Many of the tools developers need to use uh, include libraries from Intel, and they conveniently modify the code to favor their own chips. So when benchmarks run, they get better scores. I won't bore you with the technical details, but they have been caught many times. Uh, and I'm not singling them out since everyone really does it to a degree. So Samsung recently got into hot water for goosing their benchmarks. On their smartphones, uh, they run a service called GOS or a game optimizing service. The goal of that app is to limit how much of the CPU power the phone uses. It, it makes sense since a smartphone has limited real estate and, and no real way to provide proper cooling. So the phone can get really hot and drain the battery really fast if it's used at the full capacity of the chip. So what ends up happening is that the CPU has more power than the phone can effectively use. All right, I, I get that, I understand that, but guess what Samsung does? If it detects a benchmarking app running, it allows the chip to run at full speed, making you think you have a faster phone, even though you will never use all that power. Nice. Uh, the other issue with benchmarks is they don't give us usable results. For example, running Geekbench on, on the Mac, it wins. Running Cinebench, the Intel Alder Lake wins. The same goes for comparing graphics between the Ultra and the 3090. In the end, benchmarks are pieces of software and they suffer from the same bugs, inefficiencies, and not being optimized for the platform being run, so you have to take the results with a grain of salt. Where benchmarks are useful are to compare similar architectures like comparing M1 Max to Ultra, or as a tool to get a general idea of what to expect. And after watching several other channels uh, who are able to get review units and were able to run these benchmarks, what stood out to me is that a computer in a little box like this that sips power instead of gulping 400 watts on average in the case of a 3090 is in the same discussion as that beast of a card that costs $2,200. In the end, what I think matters is the user experience, and if my experience with the M1 MacBook is an indication, this thing is going to be fantastic. Now, who should get this? If you're a creative person who will deal with a ton of video footage or a developer who writes code all day, this machine is not that crazy of a purchase. Uh, having headroom to allow you to grow is a good thing. 8K video is around the corner. And if the rumor is true, the next iPhone 14 will have a 48 megapixel sensor and 8K recording capability. So why not be ready for it? Your time is money, and if you can shave off 30 minutes from your wedding project, it adds up. If a young couple, for example, is planning to start a family and they're looking to buy a house, they buy one with more than one bedroom knowing they will need those rooms eventually. So why not do that with a computer? So the Max version of the studio I feel is more slated for someone in an office environment who needs the power to process graphics or a presentation or the occasional promotional type video, basically for someone that does more than a casual user. But someone that's a casual user is better off getting like the 24 inch M1 iMac, which is powerful enough to handle their use case and extremely light where they can move anywhere in seconds. Uh, I had family members buy the iMac and they love it. It is plenty fast for what they need to do, or you can get the MacBook Air if you're looking for something more portable. So out of the box, the iPhone is set up to turn on features you really may not need that needlessly drain your battery and performance. Uh, check out this video here to find out how to prevent that. For other Apple videos, click on the playlist right here. Now, to rewire that mess behind me. Catch you in the next one.